Okay, welcome back to High Performance Computing, a practical lecture 2.1, Understanding MPI Messages and Collectives. In the first part of the course, we really had lots of practical examples, how you work with a scheduler, having a node or a couple of cores allocated in job scripts. We have seen a little bit what it means to advance from a typical C program to an MPI program, which is, let's say, basically still a valid C program, of course, but it has some MPI directives inside, which is the init, the finalize, for instance, just to create the MPI environment. And within this environment, you really can take advantage of the MPI parallel computing. So the second part of this lecture, really then thinking more about more advanced aspects. We have seen send and receive, which we refer to point to point communication. Um, we have seen already in the conceptual lecture, uh, lecture two, that there are MPI collectors as very powerful um, operations that affect not only one or two processes, but very many others, depending on the size on the communicator, of course. And these are lots of different message exchange options that we have with this. So <clears throat> let's go to the second part of the lecture. Also, perhaps understanding again a little bit the scalability term where we want to see that we can have the same source code running on four, on eight, on 12 cores maybe. And then thinking about that, of course, we are not alone on the system. So when we can freely ask for all of these resources of this different cores, what mechanism is there to keep us, let's say, a little bit more organized to think about that, of course, I have to specify maybe how long I need this course in order to have my job executed, because also many, many others want to use a computer. I cannot just allocate the course for, let's say, 8, 16 or 24 hours, maybe just for a minute. This would be relatively short or basically for an hour. And we will learn basically with the scripts and also in the second part how we actually can do this. It is basically specifically oriented towards the Slurm scheduler. That's what you know, our Uton system is on Slurm, but the same principles go also for other cluster mechanisms, for other schedulers, there's Torque, there's uh, different ones, PBS Pro still around. So basically all of them have a very similar idea of wall time, have a very similar idea of specifying exactly the number of cores or tasks per core, fine tunings, but also of course have done the idea of uh, really this wall times included. Here we now enter a little bit the second part. Uh, we had the other parts essentially covered in the first lecture. You remember we had an example of our ping pong operations by using point to point communication with send and receive and then changing roles where we essentially then again do send and receive but the in opposite direction. We basically had also the idea of using then the MPI rank more smart and saying if I'm ranked zero then I'm the ping and if I'm not or if I'm rank one, then I'm the Pong. If you then would have asked for, let's say, 10 of these in MPI com world, which we didn't do, we just asked for two. But if you would have asked for 10, but our source code says uh, essentially this is just the if rank zero or if rank one, if you remember, then nothing really happened because both, and I mean, if both basically would execute this, but all others, there would be nothing happening. They have nothing to do because they're not these ranks that don't do the ping and the pong, right? So in this sense, there would be still only two chars going over the wire, the ping and the pong, um, essentially, or no matter how much you specify in the resources. Um, let's look a little bit now um, how we get this thinking now about the number of processors versus what you do in your application. Uh, this is something which is, of course, very loaded, and this is what you will learn, really, when you do assignment one, really, uh, on your own. You will execute several times on this cluster. Now, think about using the rank again for identity, and with this also thinking about scalability. So, firstly, we have here a typical MPI program. We include MPI header. We have our rank, and, you know, this already very much basically all initialized. Uh, here, we don't take sync. Uh, basically, we don't take the size here. We have the number of processes. It doesn't matter. You define it. But what we also have is an integer buffer, so a small array of four integers, which we will actually fill inside this you know, environment that we create with MPI. But you also notice when we say source zero, we can here specify if rank equals zero or the source, 
that only rank zero is here initializing the buffer. Of course, you can play around with it in the assignment of the, the source might be processor one, then only processor one is executing. So no matter how many you will execute with, only one has essentially this buffer executed. And then essentially we'll do something with the broadcast we will soon learn. And basically then the idea is that everybody has to actually print out their buffer. So in other words, if you just keep it at this program and there's no broadcast, essentially only rank zero would have it filled because we only initialize it for rank zero. So what is broadcast and how that works? You see here essentially the idea of this collective operation. We said they operate in the so-called uh, basically world of communicators. Here we will remain in the one of all processes MPI com world. You also see that there's a specific idea what you have to provide here in information. Firstly, it's again the source. So what basically in this communicator, what rank is really taking out the initiative to send out from itself the data? This is a source and we want to know what is sent. So it's an MPI int data type. We want to know how many of those I actually sent, uh, which is here based in the count four. So four integers will be sent via the buffer to all the other processors. And this is quite now interesting to see that although I initialized only one, we're sending now from the source, which is again rank zero here, we will expect that all others actually have also something filled. So when we want to print it out, we will don't see, let's say zeros or uh, a problem of being not initialized. We really have a good, let's say, filling of uh, all this one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, why we expect one, two, three, four, you think that the buffer here is incrementally filled by also incrementing over a small for loop here. And basically this is something what we then expect in the outcome. For practical purpose and lessons learned from students, um, they want to look up sometimes, whereas you want to look up something uh, with respect to the API of MPI. I can, as one example, of course, only recommend uh, in general, of course, Google, uh, Google but if you want to have you know, um, a concrete resource, which is quite nice, you can use this Dino MPI. Um, an example is here broadcast again, when we use this and you search for it. And the reference is of course given in the lecture material. The beautiful thing is you get a very nice description what it does. Um, you have um, definitively also um, very good description of what exactly the API look like. You have possible errors. But the most interesting thing is really the example code, right? So you always see actually in a concrete example how broadcast is used and how you can use it in combination of a real, let's say, small test program. Um, and with this, you basically have quite nice uh, resources to look different things up that you want to know maybe out of this. I said also all gather was something we discussed in the last lecture on the video, if you remember, a very often used operation which not gathers just to one processor, but to all of those involved so that the data is then really on all sides. Just as a practical suggestion um, for those, because usually at that point in time, these students ask because we go to more and more functions. It's not any more send and receive. It's not a point to point communication. Here, it's a collective operation, depending on how large essentially the MPI com world is. So having done this, um, we essentially have done everything we need for our broadcast. So let's go and have a practical example. Clear here a little bit the screen and I have to go to our um, broadcast source code here. Um, and here we would expect that our C program looks like in the slides. So you noticed a couple of things here, MPI header is inside, of course, we talked about the source is a zero. We can play around a little bit with this and saying maybe it comes from different areas. It doesn't matter where it come from because broadcast will distribute this buffer that is only initialized for the source to all the others. That's the idea we want to prove. And we prove this essentially by giving them the output of the buffer. Because if this would not work, this broadcast, we will see that only the rank will have something in the buffer. And so this kind of iterative going through this area, filling the buffer would be only for one processor filled, let's say if I execute it on four. You also see that the number of processes here again is unspecified. 
right? So that I put four integers actually as this buffer over the wire uh, doesn't mean I need to have four processors um, or eight or two or whatever. So here we think about broadcast. Um, that's something filling the whole world of MPI-COM world. And when I now ask for four, it will be MPI-COM world in size of four. When I ask for eight in this job scheduler, I will have eight. So it's getting more and more trivial just for you. It's an important concept here to not program your program to a specific number of cores usually. So in other words, you have your job script, which should determine of how many uh, actually cores you want to execute this. Here we start with the small n and we maybe say four is enough. We don't want to have 12. So that's as budget. And basically have now um, the idea of the same jobs. It is scheduled. We see it's already completed. You can imagine that usually physical jobs, uh, basically, yeah, computational jobs to be more accurate, um, going or computing basically physical laws based on numerical methods, for example, they require much, much more time. So here we have, of course, very trivial examples. That's why the time use is essentially always zero, which is not completely true, but it's basically a very quick job. Um, when you have production jobs, they could take hours really to complete, right? And then, of course, we'll have not just four cores, but maybe many more in the thousands. However, here we really want to learn the basics. So it's good enough for us to think about what's coming out of this. And what we would now expect is that we have essentially four cores. And one of them was actually taking the role as the broadcaster and broadcast to everyone else. So you see here, essentially, that we fill those different buffers with 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. And this is an important part. We have it four times because we ask for four resources. And now you see basically, and this is a learning experience in this particular part now, we play now around with a number, right? But I don't touch the C code. It's not recompiled. I just added here in this job script eight. And what I can do now is just the same command as patch with this job script. And suddenly I have eight. I specified and actually will be, you know, computing on. And these cores will all do the same thing. They will broadcast one, basically will take the role of the broadcast to all the other seven in the eight. So what we expect is again having eight outcome, of course, now in our outcome. So when you do here more, you also see how that actually is then, of course, not only in the size of the output file, you see this. Um, also, essentially here we have zero, one, two, three, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And I mean, this is now, I mean, pretty obvious to you that we can go on like this. Um, of course, we have to at some point realize that the cluster is limited rather than, let's say, our possibilities here from the source code. So 12 would be, of course, now the next steps, for instance, just thinking about that we can really scale with this. So and this is the first notion of scalability you're exposed to. I have a code that gets bigger, can use more and more cores. And in some of the theoretical lectures, we will then look a bit more what speed up is. What really does it mean to have more and more cores? We expect maybe that some programs will just run faster. Here we just give output. So of course, our goal here is not to be faster with having more cores. But if you go to applications, usually the idea is to get faster the more cores you use. That doesn't apply to us here very much. Um, we have now 12 cores specified. That means, in other words, I expect in the uh, one that we just submitted here in the 51 job at the end, um, that we basically have here uh, more output. We already see that's probably true because our size is already bigger. But when we go inside, we will also see that and I will not count this, but you can do this if you want in your assignment. It's 12 times executed. So, and if you want to always know more about your jobs, um, remember that QSTAT gives you the different um, queues with all the jobs. They actually disappear over time, you remember. We had some Hello MPI jobs, they are disappearing. So they are not kept forever, but those that you just basically have executed on is of course something where um, you essentially can see um, how how much more information is there? Maybe if you want to have these things that we already said with uh, essentially 
as control show job ID. We said this, for instance, just the last one here, maybe um, to really understand what we did. And you remember we said we wanted to have 12. We know on which node it was running, uh, compute 2.0. So let's look at this. Again, we can go to our UTUN example here and can maybe see on compute 01 that there was uh, basically something happening. And yeah, this is essentially saying the where it's actually executing then if you have this. These are jobs which really have not really a big footprint. Uh, you can imagine this because they're kind of uh, really very, very small jobs. But if you have more longing run jobs, which we will do in a moment, you will see already the blueprint. You see here some of the examples I was been actually when I'm preparing this lecture and so on. Uh, in the past, in the, when you go here to the details, but you see also our executions uh, here and there on the clusters. Right, so um, this is also something which, us call, of course, is all documented. So here it's all on the slides, so don't worry about this. Uh, it's basically everything I have here in the video. I, we have also inside this slides better a little bit, let's say, described. But I want to also think about a couple of other things now when we when we do this um, and basically demonstrate you a couple of a uh, few other things when we really now play around with the runtimes a little bit on this uh, yeah cluster of the idea of U-Tune again, um, with, you know, using then the idea of a wall time and so on. So we have seen that we asked for different resources, and this is now a little bit now taking us to the world of scheduling again. So I think it's maybe better understood when we first go into this one. Remember that we asked for, let's say here, just two resources in the ping pong as just an example. And what's happening was then we got the allocation on the cluster and you know you compute something. It is could be the sailing boat on the ocean. It could be the ping pong that we've done uh, of course, these are very, let's say, very short running jobs here, this ping pong, though it's not really helping. So we create something called the sleep example here, where we specify a couple of things which are now interesting in terms of this wall time. So in other words, wall time is required so that the scheduler you see here, the blueprint of the scheduler, it's from Juvels, not from Uton, it doesn't matter, but shows you an essence of the batch queue, right? So this is a queue where this is the current time on this line. And the details here is not important for you. It's just showing that there are lots of different jobs, of course, on jewels at the time, and that there's this kind of schedule for the next couple of hours. So what's happening? Is it empty or there are a couple of nodes already allocated? And now by specifying how long your job would be, you give the cluster, of course, a possibility to plan much better, to really you know, have a good um, kind of schedule and also to prevent users from really taking the whole resource and just doing nothing, right? Maybe allocating resources unnecessary. So you can really specify here for a job, um, really the time. And this is what we mean with a wall clock time or wall time, where we have to basically have a dead end of the system executing this. In other words, here you see something like, um, we have here that the latter one is always kind of seconds, then you have minutes, you have hours, you can actually have also days, although that is getting, in my experience, let's say less and less practical implemented to run the job over many, many, many days, because we have also, of course, working horses now, which enable us much more parallelization. Still, there are jobs which really take several days. Um, we also see that this is just one component. Firstly, it's not implemented in the C program. Um, it is part of the scheduling information I give here. And of course, I'm flexible to do this. And now the first frequently asked questions from students is, how do I know how long my my kind of execution is? And the point is, you don't. You just can actually experience this. I mean, there are some values from your experience, of course. You're running the job maybe on a different HPC system, which has a CPU, which was almost at the same clock frequency, the same you know, uh, kind of uh, system around it with I.O. maybe, then you can already have some learning experience and say, oh, my job takes maybe five hours to complete. And then you would, of course, starting this maybe be a bit more, uh, more actually allocate a bit more, you would say maybe six hours, and then you just submit it. Usually, you know, when you are in scientific computing, meaning engineering science or data sciences, 
um, in several domain sciences, you will have to execute this codes incredibly often. They are not so easy to understand like hello sleep, like hello world or ping pong. You have massive application logic inside to understand fueled together with MPI, fueled by domain specific challenges and, you know, kind of physical laws that have to be computed, derivatives that has to be, you know, computed. So there are lots of, let's say, code, which are then the compute intensive parts that makes the job so long. Hence, it's also dependent of how what is the type of CPU inside? So you can never say it's on this HPC 20 minutes, then it's also on the other HPC system 20 minutes. You have to, of course, compare a little bit what the type of the CPU is. Again, think about the example here we did when we come back to our U-turn system here at the university. <clears throat> we said it's quite an old system. That's okay because it's just a teaching cluster where let's say we have this two times Intel Xeon CPU with 2.6 gigahertz. And we have 12 cores available, but here the gigahertz is reflecting to the speed, what all of you know. And of course you can imagine since now Intel has already actually created much other different ones. You can go to GARPUR for instance, as an example, where you know there those basically nodes available, but there are also Xeon Gold nodes available. There are different types of basically older CPUs. And actually, indeed, you see also an interesting example where there's even a GPU um, basically also part of it. So this depends, of course, on batch queues here on the production system. So this would require me to actually explain a little bit more. But um, it says also that, of course, the look and feel of this cluster is different, right? It has not any more four nodes. It's a production cluster that has much more nodes nodes to work in. It still has the idea of this 12 cores that we have in YouTube, but it's, let's say, much bigger. And with this come different queues for different users, those that want to have high memory and so on, those that want to use the GPUs, of course, um, things like this, which we'll be also revealing then basically in the GPU lecture we have. Just to take basically the, the idea that, of course, here the, the usage is completely different between Utun and Garpur, and you can say the same basically also when you come to the idea then uh, when we look a little bit about what's happening on the um, on the side of uh, essentially jewels on bigger, larger clusters. So here you see also the interesting um, load on this GAPO system. You see here also they have much more compute nodes than we had essentially uh, in our UTUN environment, right? And this is, of course, a key thing. And you see uh, compute nodes, but also GPUs right inside. So it's a kind of cluster that has a couple of GPUs also in each of the different nodes included. So essentially, this is interesting, but we have to go back a little bit here on the basics. We will come to this GPUs, we come to larger clusters and ideas about this later. <clears throat> but we also realize that essentially, what we talked about with this wall time is just one part of the equation here to specify this. If saying here, for instance, we have 20 uh, seconds where we want to execute this job. And if it doesn't execute in 20 seconds, then we just have to actually stop it. Uh, some people would actually say kill it. Um, that is also modus operandi sometimes. Uh, the more, let's say, proper way of saying is it that the job were running against the wall. Right, the wall time was actually defined with 20 seconds. And uh, literally, if you want to have an illustrative example, the boat was on the ocean, computed, computed for 20 seconds, and then there's no compute time anymore because the scheduler says, okay, whatever you have here as a job in your folder of to be done with this kind of sailing boat, I don't care, I just stop the job. Um, I think it's a hard mechanism sometimes for starters to understand that this is existing. It prevents overload of the system, basically that people take advantage of the system for too long, that the schedule can be much more optimized. There are lots of benefits by specifying the wall time. It seems, of course, not natural to do so. You want to job to finish, but you have to give the schedule a little bit of, you know, an indicator. Otherwise, um, it is with many, many different users, of course, a very complex thing to do. And if you block the whole system with a very long running job, um, but essentially the job is doing almost nothing, then basically the administrators will also call you and say, you allocated many idle nodes, what's happening here? So this is a very practical aspect of really using then the wall time 
um, I want to show you this um, by the example of jewels again so that you trust me on this. Um, we can here go to this uh, to the uh, jewel system. Let me just think about which of this is this here. Uh, but, uh, it's not there. It's hard to get to it because of our nice zoom. So I do the following of using this. So when you do jewels, for instance, jewels, JC, wall time, you will see a, a quick introduction to the usage model, which also the production systems always have. You see, of course, our cluster module and booster module we discussed. Um, and of course, also that they have much more advanced node than our teaching clusters. Apparently, um, you see here, let's say 48 nodes, which were in the cluster module with high thing as red performance. And then really the booster modes where we said it has a lot of this very cutting edge GPUs from A100s. But the way how you use this massive system, really, you know, it was number one in Europe or it is number one in Europe right now in the time of recording, of course, but um, we will see that the way how we actually now use it with the SPETCH command is the same thing. So you have indeed even Slurm on the system. Of course, you have much more nodes to allocate. You see here, uh, nodes 64, for instance, what you would maybe use as a large physics application. You have still this wall time actually that you specify. Here's an example of saying it will run maximum for 15 minutes, then it will run against the wall, or for 20 minutes, just to give you an example. The different partitions you can actually use in the script, but that's not so important right now here. But the way how you would actually use the systems is essentially very similar. You can fine tune it with the number of tasks, and then this is a notion which is not so important right now. You can specify even which number of tasks are per node um, to really there making interesting know, performance speed ups, something we will have in later lectures. It goes beyond really the, the kind of initial setup here. But it captures again the essence that what I'm telling you here with the wall clock time, the wall time you have to specify is really important. It is practice in almost all HPC centers I know, and therefore it's very important to specify. Hence, we want to do this in our uh, assignment one, right? So there's something where you have to play around a bit with the sleep command. But I'll show you also a couple of examples now. And they take some time. So of course, every now and then it will be a bit getting boring perhaps. So we want to go to a hello sleep example here. And the hello sleep example is now uh, an interesting example because it is essentially doing nothing but for a long time. Uh, what, what do I mean by this? So there's the certain sleep command. Again, if you go to the um, you know, kind of a idea of a API, there would be somewhere a description and we want to sleep. We want to basically let the processes that we allocate do nothing, but do nothing as a function. So we could do a loop, we could do something else. But here in, in this example, we just take advantage of a so-called um, uh, function sleep, which actually sleeps for a number of seconds that you give and have here uni standard ha, which is a header that we want to use for that. And basically, if you look at the source code right now, then that's what we did. We basically have the include statement here of using the header. We define as a variable of saying sleep seconds, 120. So it is around two minutes. And then basically we just say it here for one rank. Um, now it, you think it's, you know, it will be executed maybe two times as an example to make it really parallel um, to really see the hello world from different processes here. But in the end, what it does mean is just give you once the sleep seconds out. Uh, this is just to give you an indicator how many actually minutes or seconds essentially here we really sleep and do nothing. Um, but it's just an output. And before we're going to sleep for this time, we actually give it a cool short output um, in our, let's say, uh, description uh, or basically in our output file. And then we sleep. And then when we're out of sleep, then we basically uh, write another, let's say, lines in our output file. So the way or why I do this is essentially to capture now two things. The first is we will execute and then we'll specify the wall time to be not enough. So we will see that um, basically when we go to the job script, we will have something which is less than this 120 
um, seconds and we want to understand what happens then, right? So we expect, of course, the scheduler will do something with it because apparently we say my job needs two seconds in the source code, but the scheduler doesn't know it and doesn't want to know it because what we do essentially is here, um, we basically want to maybe restrict it just to 30 uh, seconds here instead of you know what we just seen uh, with 120. So after the 30 seconds, there should be something happening, uh, apparently that this job is somehow stopping, which would be of course not nice because we expect also when we look in this hello, hello uh, sleep.c that this might be exactly when we sleep, right? So that the interrupt will come that we have to stop working. That means the second part here after being awake or basically being awake now will never be written in the file because we cannot go to it. Um, the computing is over. Right, and this is a good example, of course, and you can imagine that this is then not properly executed. So the next time you run it, you maybe want to adjust it then to more than two minutes so that this job can be properly um, basically running. I do a little bit of help of a clock here to get you essentially into this idea. Of course, it's not completely precise. Think about that the scheduler itself has some overhead preparing the job, putting the job, if you remember, with MPR run on the different compute nodes gathering the results from the different compute nodes into one output. So all of this gives you some overhead that it's basically not completely different accurately here to the time. And then generally, if you're in signs, you would also do 10 runs, for instance, or five runs and then take the average times on the, of those run times if you want to benchmark, for instance, or basically compute the performance of these uh, basically uh, speed ups. We really use several different runs usually to make an average around it. But this is already going quite far more for the scientists and PhD students are basically among you. Here we want to now espatch this uh, particular one. Basically we stop that again, but here we say espatch submit hello sleep, which should now basically be running. That's something what you also never said because immediately the jobs were always running. We start here at the counter as I said, the immediate seconds are not so important, but the trouble is we have now essentially what we expect is that this job cannot really finish. It will be running and we can monitor this, of course. So with QSTAT, it should continue running. It is in the queue. We can have, of course, OS control again with having essentially more information where it's run. It is inside the running time. Also, this is something we didn't have before because the job is actually still running. So let's look at it and says a little bit like job state running. And of course, again, which node is running, how many CPUs reduce and so on. That's not so important right now. More important is that basically our QSTAT will at some point in time probably say around basically then um, the specified time that this is not anymore running. So here we are already a bit beyond this. So we expected it had already happened and you see indeed it is completed. Is it completed really? Or is it maybe completed because the scheduler thinks it's completed and just stopped the job? And then with the overhead and, and so on and stopping it, we maybe came to a longer time here, which was of course a little bit around a minute or so. Um, but it was definitely not the two minutes uh, actually that we, we applied for right in our job or that the job requires. So let's look what how that would look like and how we can identify if a job was really, let's say, going through. We see here it's the same job, the 52 job we want to look in. And what we expect is now that, of course, we say we have 120 um, uh, seconds. It's actually not millisleep seconds, it's sleep seconds. Then uh, we basically say, okay, um, we're going to sleep now. And oh, suddenly inside the sleep, of course, we said it's not enough. Um, we have here a problem. We really need to um, essentially say this job is broken. And you see here, you get from the scheduler, the slurm was stepping in, so to speak, and says this on the compute to zero is actually canceled due to time limit. And this explains your um, forwarding, of course, you you can identify this by the output and also that your job is really not completed. And of course, now we would think 
um, instead of doing this, we maybe want to um, do this and um, maybe do this the other way around also. You have now learned that uh, maybe we should really think about more getting experience of runtimes of this. So when we do hello sleep here and removing this and create ourselves something different, um, basically in this kind of uh, part here. So we can maybe say in terms of sleep seconds, 60, 20, we can say it should be running three minutes. And that's nothing else I change. I just what I wanted to do is, of course, I have a longer sleep time now, uh, just to make a longer run job, really. You remember, we have to now also do the proper thing of, um, because I'm not sure if we have already that this module load can open MPI and then we can MPI CC, essentially the hello sleep C here and give the output file to hello sleep to have it again. After removing, so this is a new version we have, it will run then three minutes. So what we, of course, have to adjust to really get the rest of our lecture with three minutes, we have to adjust that this is not just aborted after half a minute. Uh, and so here we say maybe we want to uh, get rid of this and put here zero. And we say the job should be running maybe for nine minutes, right? So when you play around with this, remember if you just add here seconds, this could be always the overhead of the schedule, though this will be kind of a bit dodgy there. You will not see really the effect. So if you do this in the assignment, use larger numbers really to get the effects. Like we say now, we have three minutes, and after three minutes, the job is essentially ready, uh, roughly. And then, you know, however, we could run until nine minutes. So that just to see that we can actually also be awake at some point in time, what is, of course, an interesting for us. So again, we think you have a very, let's say, gracious, very, let's say, positive way of having time now in the world time, which is maybe also not good because we know it running three minutes, but it's of course here an idea of how you show a little bit in terms of teaching. So this will be now executed. Um, this is no surprise, it's running. It will be running for around three minutes. So let's move a little bit here in time and take a little bit of the time to understand it. So. While we wait for the three minutes, I just want to basically go here through this again, thinking about that um, there are different ways um, how you can also cancel the job, right? So this was now really from the scheduler, making it really hard, running against the wall. That's the point here of saying uh, it is directly canceled. Now, when you as a user want to cancel a job as well, there's a possibility for this too. It's called the S cancel here. With a job ID, so if you, let's say, submit um, basically three, four jobs and you want to cancel one uh, because you did the wrong parameter, it was basically maybe two little seconds to sleep or you sleep with, uh, don't basically thought it's milliseconds and then it's seconds in your API, then suddenly the, the it will sleep forever and you want to actually avoid this. Although, of course, you have the wall talk time that takes care of it sometimes and then execute a stop from the scheduler. You can also do it, of course, on your own with this ends cancel job ID. Just want to demonstrate this maybe shortly while we wait here. We see essentially with a QStat, as we expected, the job is still running and will continue to do so. We are just at one minute. But what we can do is also to submit another one and another one. And we have two more jobs now, which are all doing and sleeping. And let's assume we want to have the new ones we just had actually cancelled on our own. So then you do this interesting command I just said to you, which is not bad to use. So every time you think you have unnecessary computing, of course, this makes completely sense to, let's say, remove this job. We did as cancel here and we see in this schedule, suddenly it's basically not anymore there or basically completed because we already, let's say, have cancelled it. And the way you can do the same, of course, then for our four job. We don't want to kill our long running job because we want to see what's coming out of this, if we can be awake after some certain period in time. Another essence I want to show with a practical example is that there is still no outcome, right? If you think about uh, this, what we have um, from the whole job, here we have this running job and what we want to see, maybe if we do just a simple more on it, 
here while it's running it was already saying okay 180 that's what we know we coded it but there's no output yet of being awake now because we are still sleeping in this job it's executed but we already have the output basically of saying what's happening before we went to sleep so this also shows you that you have an incremental update sometimes of these outputs which is quite nice and uh, of course could be also misleading here now again from the idea of would be this first processor getting the idea of writing this to the file or the second processor here it could be not the same order as you already know this is not really deterministic so now we're getting a little bit impatient basically we want to see a little bit of um, what is this and basically this this kind of computing power here so that we um, can a little bit understand that ah it's getting over three minutes so uh, every now and then we think now okay this job should be probably completed and it is although of course you remember with the job script we would still have six more minutes to execute it so essentially we were very safe and in other words um, to really finish this up we expect now of course um, to have then also now the awake message because the sleep was properly executed it was finishing not interrupted by everyone, anyone, not by the scheduler, not by us personally with the S cancel. So essentially we would assume that here is then of course now the just awake now, uh, which happens after the sleep command and just immediately before we finalize the MPI job. So I think that really was a very practical setup how you can deal with the assignment, how you can actually work with many other HPC systems in the world and start your baby steps. So it's really the key essence of commands, of understanding wall time, of compiling, of loading modules. All of this fit together and the scheduler is of course your best friend, but could be also your best enemy if the system is completely full and you basically get just the slot and have to wait a long time to get basically scheduled. Um, this is something we will also experience when we have larger jobs and when you do your assignments together in the moment you see the load of Uton is quite low but when we do all our assignments on the oceans everybody has let's say 12 CPUs and more um, then suddenly it's get really full and warm on the systems and then you have to wait because other students or other student groups are executing their assignment and hence here goes a recommendation start the assignments early you have now everything you need to really start with assignment one early you have still a month to do so to work on the assignment one but don't do it last minute if you do it last minute the scheduling impact could be that many of you doing it last minute and as we have just not infinite resources in the computing you cannot do all your assignment because essentially you're waiting until others have done their job and it could be really frustrating to wait again for let's say for a couple of minutes then your job will be executed it has a very long iteration cycle hence by having more time like a whole month we can play with the schedule so groups will work differently and you have u turn for yourself every now and then maybe and with this really use the time that's my final recommendation here and the next basically lecture will be then looking a little bit more conceptually again how i really create different domain decompositions right how i crush down a big problem into a few to really use mpi massively on different parallel resources in order to also maybe make something like a speed up so basically crunching a big problem into smaller in order to make the application smaller something we don't really tackled yet but we will materialize when we have lecture three next time